heard it when it came up behind me. The hard sounds of branches rubbing against each other, muffled by the softer, wetter sounds of squelching meat. My skin prickled as my heart picked up its pace. I was exposed, caught in the silverly spotlight of a thumbnail moon. Something puffed in front of me, and it took a moment to realize it was my breath. The air around me had begun to freeze, burning my throat as I took another step forward, preparing to run. That's when it said my name. I, I, look, I'm just saying, if you're going to tell a creepy story, you need a name that's not so fucking stupid, man. Colby scowled at me. It's not my name for it, dude. It's just a name. He shrugged before feeling compelled to add, fuck you. I snickered at him. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Something you read on the internet then. Still lame. The slumberjack? What, does he sneak into your house and cut down trees while you're asleep? Maybe he hides in the toilet and steals your floaters. Brina was down the table from us, but she snorted and shook her head at that last. The dark look on Colby's face had only deepened, and I knew from experience I was on the edge between fucking with him and really hurting his feelings. Okay, never mind, smartass. I rolled my eyes. No. I, I, I want to hear it. I'm just busting your balls, man. Tell me. He grimaced at me while weighing his desire for me to beg against his clear excitement to tell the story. Finally, he shrugged. <sighs> Fine. I'll be the smaller asshole and tell it. And then he did. So the story I read was that the Slumberjack is really old. Like, he's been traced back to Europe during the Middle Ages. The stuff I was reading didn't really know what he's supposed to be. Some kind of monster, maybe? Or a demon? Who knows? What he does, though, I mean, he's kind of like a fucked up genie. Brenna snorted some water down the table as Colby shot her a dirty look. For my part, I was having trouble keeping a straight face, so I ate a bite of sandwich and nodded before talking around that. So, he's a fucked up genie, or something. Got it. Yeah, like... Well, you'll see what I mean. So, the early stories of him are from travelers that were going through the forest. They'd come across a stranger, a tall man wearing a long green coat with a thick gray beard. He'd greet them, and if they responded, he'd invite them to barter with him. Like, do a trade. The deal was, he offered you the thing you wanted the most for the thing you valued the least. That sounds like a good deal, right? Except he didn't just ask you what you wanted to trade. He looked into your heart and saw what you really wanted and wanted to get rid of. A lot of the stories are about, well... Not him tricking people, really, but things turning out differently than they expected. Not happy endings, I mean. But that was the old version, right? Now people don't wander around the woods too much, which, guess, sucks for the slumberjack, but with the internet, more people know about him, too. So he's changed with the times. Slumberjack 2.0. Brianna laughed as she got up from the table and walked toward the trash cans, but when I looked back at Colby, he was staring me down. Look, fucker. If you don't stop it, I won't tell you the rest. Grinning, I nodded. Sorry. I'll shut up. Go on. Narrowing his eyes, he nodded and stared back. So now, he comes to people's homes at night, but only if he's invited. To invite him, you melt down a candle, mix in some of your own blood, and then remake the candle so it can sit up and burn. Then, on the next new moon, you light it up and put it in a window. He'll come while you sleep, and when you wake up, the trade will be complete. 
Colby sat back with a satisfied smile as I stared at him. That's it? So it's just a ritual creepy pasta or something? <laughs> like, do this weird thing and this spooky thing will happen. Ooh, wooga. His smile slipped away. I mean, I guess. But there were lots of people saying that they knew people that had tried it and were warning everyone to take it seriously and not mess with it. Giving a small laugh, I smiled at him. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. That's what people do, right? Don't do this. This one's real. My sister's roommate tried, and my uncle works for Nintendo. I shook my head. It's just part of pumping it up, man. All those things are bullshit. I could see the hurt in his face, so I tried to change subjects. So, why is he called the Slumberjack? Seriously, I, I don't understand. Nodding, Colby leaned forward. Some of the people were talking about that, too. Apparently Jack used to be slang for a man, and so, like, Lumberjack is a lumberman. So maybe Slumberjack is supposed to be, like, a sleep man, or... The Sandman or something. I eyed him dubiously. I guess that's kind of cool. The bell rang and as we picked up our lunch trays, I grinned at him. It's a neat story, man. I started to laugh. Fucked up genie. Ow! I almost dropped the tray as pain shot through my left side. Colby stepped forward with a worried look. Are you okay? I glanced down at my side and back to my face. You need to go to the doctor. He could have punctured a lung or something. I frowned at him and shook my head. It was two days ago. I'd be worse than this if he had. My ribs are just bruised from where the fucker kicked me. Obi sighed and nodded uncertainly. Maybe. But you, you should tell someone. A teacher or the cops or something. I waggled my thumb at him. It had been three years and I couldn't straighten it all the way. I tried that before, remember? She always protects him. Lies for him. I spit onto the concrete. It's my dumb ass for trying to get away this time. It leaves me alone if I don't get in the way. We were walking toward the main building now, and for a few moments we were both quiet. And Colby suddenly asked something he'd never asked before. Why does your dad hurt your mom like that? I shrugged. I used to think it was just because he had a temper. And hell, he does have that, but when I was little, I still thought he loved us. After he bent back my thumb and sent her to the hospital, I decided he was just evil. And maybe that's true too, but after I tried to tell and she backed him up, I let out a long breath. <sighs> Fuck, man. This last time? She was apologizing to him while he was kicking me for trying to defend her stupid ass. And when he stopped, she didn't even check on me until the next day. She doesn't love me either. She's as bad as he is, and I'm fucking done with both of them. Colby reached out and patted my shoulder. I'm sorry, man. That sucks. You know you can stay over at my house anytime if it gets too bad. I gave him a smile. I know, but I can handle it. I won't let them beat me. You know what I mean. I'll hang in until I graduate, and then... I'm fucking out of here. He grinned back at me. Yeah. State college, here we come. Colby cocked an eyebrow at me. And if it gets too bad before then, just ask the slumberjack to take them away. I snorted. <laughs> yeah, I might just do that. I didn't do it that day or that week. I didn't even think about it until months later. One moonless night when they were screaming and fighting for so long that they seemed to get bored of it and wanted to turn it on me. 
I locked my bedroom door and stuck a chair under the knob, but when they got tired of pounding on the other side, I still waited until I could hear them back in their room before I risked trying to go to sleep. But despite feeling exhausted, I wasn't sleepy at all. Instead, I was wired on a restless anger that was hell on its way to becoming a weary hatred for them both. Knowing that they were turning me into something hateful, something closer to them than I'd ever want to be, only made me hate them more. It was then, laying in the hot darkness in my barricaded room, that I remembered the slumberjack. I felt silly as I dug up an old pack of birthday candles from the bottom of my closet, and for a moment I wasn't sure how to meld it in such a way that I could reform it at all. Then I took an old straw from the trash, folded it over one end while melting two candles into the other. I had already cut and split a shoelace to make a thin wick, so all that was left was pricking my finger over the waxy mixture before it began to harden. An hour later, I gently cut away the straw, and I was left with a thin, crooked, but surprisingly decent-looking blood candle. After I lit it in my window, I slept like the dead. Good morning, sweetie. I jerked at my mother's voice as I stepped into the kitchen. I hadn't expected the slumberjack to actually come and take them away, but I hadn't expected this either. I looked up at her warily, searching for sarcasm or the preamble of screaming, but no. She was just smiling at me as she cooked something on the stove. Just cooking some eggs. You want some? I nodded uncertainly. Uh, yeah, sure. She nodded. Coming up. She glanced past me. Morning, sleepyhead. Breakfast will be ready soon. I felt my guts tighten as I turned to look at my father as he passed. He patted me on the shoulder and went over to get some coffee. So, what do you have planned for today? I shrugged. Uh, I was just going to hang out with Colby. His cousin's in a band, and we were going to watch him practice, maybe. My father nodded as he smiled. Sounds cool. He pointed at me, his face growing more serious as my balls tightened. Be home for dinner, okay? We haven't had a good family dinner in a long time, and I mean to correct that. A drop of blood ran from his left nostril, and he wiped at it absently as he held my gaze. Yeah, uh, sure. There was a strange, creaking noise behind me, and I jumped as my mother set down a plate of eggs. Eat up. You're still a growing boy. It was so weird, dude. Colby shrugged. We were sitting out in the driveway of his cousin's house. The band had practiced, and it had been pretty bad, but at least it had distracted me for a little while. Maybe they felt guilty and are trying to be less assholey? Maybe. But they were really different acting. They tried to suck up before when they thought I might report them, but this was different. It was like they were different people. They even looked a little different. He raised an eyebrow. I I know how that sounds. I... I don't know. They just seemed off somehow. I can't put my finger on it. I could tell Colby wanted to make a joke, but something stopped him. Instead, he just looked off into the distance. You can always come over to our house. Dad's making lasagna, I think. I heard the bitterness in my laugh. I wish I could, but apparently we're having a family dinner tonight. I checked my phone. Shit, it's almost five. Time to go. They were waiting at the kitchen table when I got home. My chest tightened as soon as I saw them there. 
This was a trap. They'd done stuff like this before. Set me up so it'd be like I did something wrong. Did something they said not to. Not did something they wanted to. Or maybe just show up late when I hadn't known I was going to be. It was all just a trick, though. Just a justification to yell at me, to punish me, as though sometimes they couldn't get the full, just tearing chunks out of each other. Walking into the kitchen, I sat my bag down without looking at them. Sorry, I didn't know we were having dinner so early. It was my father that spoke, even as I saw my mother get up out of the corner of my eye. Not a problem, son. We didn't say a specific time, after all. Just glad we're all together now. Feeling a bit confused, I nodded and took my seat. When I glanced up at my father, I recoiled slightly. There was dried blood on his top lip, and his right eye was drooping like he'd had a stroke. Dad, are you... dinner served? I jumped, the same as that morning. There had been an odd background noise since my mother had gotten up from the table, but I'd been so focused on him that I'd ignored it. But it was close now. A rough, scraping sound, married to something soft and moist. I didn't know how, but it sounded like it was coming from... I looked down on my plate. It was heaped high with grass and leaves bound together by twigs and black mud. My stomach dropped. What was this? Some new kind of bullshit? I glanced around for my mother to try and get a read on her expression. Was this a bad joke or something worse? She was already on the way back to the table with their plates, both heaped high with more of what was on mine. As I stared, she sat the plates down before taking her seat, and before I could make myself say anything, they were already grabbing up fistfuls of the muck and forest bits and shoving them into their mouths. My mother paused after a couple of handfuls and turned to me. She smiled, mud and twigs sticking out of her mouth as she leaned forward, her eyes bloodshot and streaming what might be tears, though they were dark brown and had a sharp smell that stung my nose as she grew closer. Why aren't you eating, honey? You have to eat your dinner. You're still a growing boy. I felt the thing that looked like my father grab my arm gently, but firmly. That's why we're here, dear. To make sure he grows up right. Turning to look at him, I saw his mouth was already caked with dirt. And in a couple of places, his skin poked out strangely. Whether it was from a twig poking into his cheek or something wrong underneath the face he wore, I couldn't say. All I knew was that I had to get away before. Mother thing stood up to my right and grabbed my shoulder, pushing me back down into my seat even as I started to get up. With her other hand, she reached forward onto my plate and grabbed a fistful of the filth before pressing it against my lips as I choked. Open up and eat it. It's okay. I'll feed you like when you were a baby, and after the first few bites, I bet you won't stop. I managed to get my feet up enough to kick out at the center support of the table, and when I did, the table went one way while I fell back in my chair the other. I was free of their grip, if only for a moment, but that was time enough. I hadn't lived with my parents all my life and not learned how to run and hide. I called as I headed for the door, and I could hear them behind me coming for me. I didn't know what they were, who they were, and I didn't know what they were capable of. We lived three miles from the nearest neighbor, and I had to leave my phone behind in my bag. So unless I could sneak back inside without them noticing and get my phone or some car keys, my best bet was to hide somewhere until they gave up looking. So that's what I did. I hid in the woods near the house, watching them as they wandered around the yard, checked the garage and my father's work shed, all the while calling out for me to come and finish dinner. It was dark soon, 
and while it would hopefully make it easier for me to slip away, the night also meant I couldn't see them anymore, making it easier for them to slip up on me if I wasn't careful. Shuddering at the thought, I looked up at the sky. There was only a small sliver of moon in the sky tonight, but it would have to be enough. Turning in what I thought was the direction of the Anderson farm, I started to make my way through the trees. I'd made it out into the first field when I heard the things that looked like my parents behind me. I broke into a run, at first in the same direction I'd already been going, but it didn't take long to realize that it wasn't going to work. I was still too far away from our neighbor, and they were faster than me. I'd never make it before they ran me down. So I forced myself to cut left, back into the trees and curving back to the house. If I couldn't outrun them, I needed to get to a phone or a car or a weapon. Something, anything to stop them from, well, whatever it was they were trying to do to me. When I hit the yard, I initially planned to head for the house. Grab my phone, lock myself in my room until help arrived, but but they'd caught up again. I felt one of their hands brush my back as I pushed myself to go faster, even as my lungs and legs protested. I'd never make it inside in time. My eyes fell on the shed. It locked from the outside, but there were tools in there that I could use to defend myself. And if they tried to lock me in, I could always crawl out through the window. I juked right and headed for the building, closing the door a moment before they hit it. Bracing myself against it, I looked around for something that might work. There was a saw, a couple of hammers, a shovel, but all of them meant getting close to those things. And even one of them was faster and stronger than I was. I ignored their calls from outside just to come out as I flipped on the light to see things better. That's when I saw the gas cans in the corner. The police thought I'd killed my parents for a while, but they could never prove anything. They had both disappeared, yes, and the work shed next to the house had burned down, but that was all. The samples they'd taken from the smoldering piles inside, well, if they got anything from them at all, my guess it was nothing human. And I hadn't given them anything to work with. I could have told them about bracing the door with the shovel while I pushed over the cans of gasoline and dumped them on the floor, how I had to scrabble for something to light the fire until I found a book of matches my father had squirreled away next to an old pack of cigarettes in one of the work table's drawers. Maybe explain to them how terrified I was and that they would get in before I could turn off the lights and get into the window. Called to them even as I slipped outside and around to the door. How I'd known every moment that it wouldn't work and that they'd catch me and kill me or worse, turn me into whatever they were. But now, for once, things had gone my way. They'd pushed past the shovel as I got in the corner of the shed, and when they went in, I pulled the door shut and locked it. They were beating on it immediately, but I wasn't giving them a chance to break back out. It only took three matches through the window for the whole thing to catch, and I waited until it was burned down to nothing before I went back inside, cleaned up, and called 911. I told them I'd woken up to find my parents gone and the shed burned down. Wouldn't someone please help me? And for the next three months, every time anyone asked what happened, I acted like that was all that I knew. Anyone except Colby. I told him everything. And to his credit, he believed me. Or at least he acted like he did. His parents took me in until I turned 18 and graduated. After that, we both headed to college. In the years since, we've always stayed close. And in that time, I've never told anyone else what really happened. So when I started having the dreams, it was Colby I called. When I told him I had to go back to the house, he asked if I wanted company. It had been five years since the night it all happened, and other than packing up some stuff when I first moved in with Colby's family and a bit more when I went to college, I hadn't been back in all that time. 
I tried to sell the place, but there had been no takers, and so I'd left it to rot until I figured out what to do with it. The grass had grown into a jungle, but Colby had an SUV, so we drove up to the house anyway. When we got out, he started heading for the front door, but I shook my head. Dreams hadn't been about the house, after all. I could see them laying in the grass before they noticed us. Two figures, half-formed, half-grown, matted sculptures of bark and mud and strange meat. Sculptures crafted by strange, unseen hands and given life by the slumberjack? Or by me? You. You're back. Oh, God. The words came out. Almost as a moan, and behind me, Colby let out a yell. When I looked back, his eyes were wide as he looked down at the twitching figures in the grass, and then back up at me. Jesus. I never really thought. I nodded. I know. But they're real, and they're growing back. I noticed more motion from the grass. And when I looked back, I saw they were both trying to crawl toward me, though they weren't making any real progress. Their arms were only half developed and their roots were still sunk deep into the ashes of the shed. They were like new growth after a foster fire. Alive, but fragile. We will always come back for you. We love you. The tears that leapt into my eyes surprised me, taking my breath for a moment. I felt Colby's hand on my shoulder and I nodded at him. You know, when I lit that candle, <laughs> what I wished for was that they would just go away. For me to be free, to have a normal life. I gave a watery laugh. <laughs> but I don't think that's really what I wanted. As much as I hated them, I didn't really want to lose them. I just wanted them to be different. <laughs> to love each other. To love me and... I puffed out a breath. <sighs> and for them to never give up on me the way I'd given up on them. You still need to eat your dinner. I shook my head. Go get the gas can. They screamed when the gas hit them. I guess they knew from experience what was coming next. It was an awful sound, but it would be over soon. At least for a few more years. Colby was holding a twist of newspaper and a box of matches. He offered to do it for me. And I told him no. If he'd just hold the paper, I'd light it and take care of the rest. They'd stopped screaming now. Instead, staring up at me as they clawed the earth and tried to reach me, their eyes faintly glowing like fireflies in the shadows of the deepening afternoon. We... We love you. Choking back a sob, I struck the match. <laughs> I know. Sam fell down the stairs. It was dark, and she must have gotten up for a glass of water or something. This isn't the first time she's tripped or fallen or generally had an accident because she's something of a klutz. Was something of a klutz. I heard her fall and stumbled out of bed and down the stairs immediately after it happened. By the time I was kneeling next to her, she wasn't breathing and I couldn't feel a heartbeat. I called 911, but when they arrived, they were only able to confirm what I already knew. She'd broken her neck in the fall and died on impact. My sister, my best friend, died for no reason at 26. 
She and I had been living together at the time. After mom and dad died in a car accident and passed the house down to us, we thought we'd just stay there. All we really had left was each other, because we'd always been close. And then she died, and I was left with nobody. Just me in that creaky old house on the edge of town. Mom and Dad had left us enough money that we could afford a nice funeral for her. The best casket money could buy, a nice headstone, the works. I put her in her favorite dress and had all her best pictures on a poster board next to her casket during the wake. All for nothing, of course. None of it would bring her back, and it's not like she could appreciate it, but it felt better than doing nothing. I guess that's the moral of the story that every funeral is trying to tell us. We do all this shit for the living, not the dead. It's one thing to know that, but it's another to feel how true it is in the moment. Her death was about a year ago, exactly a year, actually, this October 17th. Things started getting weird a week after the funeral. Weird might be understating it. I woke up one morning and came down the stairs to make myself some coffee and breakfast. As soon as I walked into the kitchen, I saw Sam sitting at the table. Her eyes were closed and her skin looked... A little more red than normal. Like she had mild sunburn or something. And there was flesh blood around her nose and mouth. She wasn't a hallucination and she wasn't a ghost. She was a corpse. A corpse that should have been in a coffin six feet deep in the ground, sitting at my kitchen table. I couldn't handle it. I screamed and I called the police and started shouting what probably sounded like gibberish into the phone. They had someone at the house in under 10 minutes, during which time they'd stayed on the phone with me, trying to understand what my emergency was. When they walked in the door, it became very apparent why I'd called them. I thought at first maybe I'd just lost it, you know? I was seeing something that wasn't really there. The stress of Sam's death had eaten a hole in my perception of reality and caused a total mental breakdown. But the cops confirmed that what I was seeing was real. And they immediately ushered me out of the house so they could examine the crime scene, if that's what you want to call it. They conducted an investigation, but that left us with more questions than answers. First, there was no sign of forced entry in the house. The only door had still been locked and deadbolted when I woke up in the morning. The windows were locked from the outside, so how did the perpetrator get in and out? Second, her grave was undisturbed. The police had it dug up again, and they were able to confirm the vault containing the coffin hadn't been tampered with. The coffin itself hadn't either. It's just that her body wasn't inside. They determined that she must not have been placed in the coffin at all, but that couldn't be possible. I had seen her in it at the funeral. I'd watched them close the coffin lid and place her in the hearse. When would someone have time to steal her body? Third, there was just no motive. Who would do something like that to me? I didn't have any enemies that I knew of. I didn't know a single person capable of something like this. Naturally, suspicion fell upon me. I must have taken the body and staged it in the house. For what purpose, nobody could say. Maybe I was just a sicko, right? Or having some kind of mental breakdown, after all, losing the last member of my family. The police weren't able to prove that I'd done it, most likely because I didn't do it, so I wasn't charged with anything. 
They just supervised the reinterment of my sister's body so they could be certain she would actually be placed in her grave this time. As for me, I just hoped that would be the end of it. I didn't even care whether or not they found who did it because I just wanted it to be over so I never had to think about it again. And as the weeks went by and nothing else happened, it seemed like my wish was going to come true. And then one morning, I woke up and smelled something. I'd never smelled a rotting body before, but I knew instantly that's what it was. There's something instinctive inside of us that recognizes the smell of death. That was the only warning I had before I turned over and saw her. Sam's body was in the bed with me. Her skin had begun to turn green and sort of slip off of her bones. Her eyes were completely gone. Her hair and teeth had begun to fall out. Her mouth was slack and open like she was screaming. The fluids from her body had stained the bedsheet a sick brown color. I stumbled into the bathroom to vomit before calling the police again. I don't think they were happy to have me call. They'd probably written me off as crazy, and it took considerably longer, almost a full hour, for them to send someone out to the house. But they smelled her body as soon as they walked into that door, and they were upstairs in a second, instructing me to wait outside and not to go anywhere. It's funny. The entire time they were in the house, and then as they were driving me down to the station, all they could think was how I wish I'd gotten her embalmed. It's a family thing. My mom and dad were against embalming, thought it was so unnatural. They even put it in their will that they didn't want to be embalmed. So I didn't have Sam embalmed either, because... I don't know. It felt right. If I'd known I was going to be sharing a bed with her corpse weeks after her death, I would have definitely made a different choice. It's funny. The kinds of things we think about when our lives fall apart around us, isn't it? Once again, there was no sign of forced entry. No sign of tampering with her grave. The hardened dirt had been undisturbed. The vault was locked. This time, the police were absolutely baffled. I think they wanted to blame me, but how could they? The police themselves had watched her body being reinterred. It was, frankly, impossible for her to be up there in my bed. They questioned me a little longer this time. There had to be a reason this was happening. Somebody must be behind this. And if it wasn't me, then who? They questioned me about every single person I knew. It was grueling and exhausting at the end. And we got no closer to an answer. In the weeks that followed, after her body was put back in the ground for a third time, they still couldn't figure out how the crime had been carried out. The incident had shaken me to the core. I I was an absolute wreck. Every time I heard the house creak, I panicked. I became convinced someone was living in the house with me. How else was the criminal getting in and out so seamlessly? They must have a key or have fashioned a hidden entrance or something. Eventually, I couldn't take it any longer and I put the house up for sale. It took some time before it finally sold. People aren't keen on buying a house where someone's recently died, and they're definitely not interested in houses where corpses randomly show up from time to time. I had to sell it far below its market value, but at that point, I didn't care. I just needed to get away from that place. I took the money from the house and what my parents and sister had left behind and bought myself a little place about four states away. It was modest but modern. No creaky floorboards or strange sounds for me to be obsessed over. Nobody knew me there. 
It'd be a fresh start. I even changed my name and took the time to cover my tracks so whoever had been following me wouldn't be able to find me. Over the next few months, things gradually got better. But eventually, I was able to get a job and even make friends with a few of my co-workers. I started to have a social life again and began feeling normal, I guess. I still missed Sam and I still had nightmares, but overall, things were getting better every day and I could see a future ahead of me. A future worth sticking around for. And then one morning, a few weeks ago, it happened again. In the living room this time. Most of her skin was gone, though some of it still clung to her skeleton. I could see her bones this time. Her hair and teeth were missing. There were bugs wriggling in her eye sockets. Maggots, I supposed. The local police were horrified. Their horror only got worse when I told them that this wasn't the first time it had happened. They contacted the police department from my hometown and they told me they'd find whoever had done this. That they'd put them in jail and make sure they stayed there. I'd be safe, they assured me. I don't believe them. Word spread around town about what had happened and about my history. I lost my friends at work and people looked at me differently. I could see it in their eyes. I ended up quitting my job and I've been out of work since. I'd move again if I thought it would help. The thing is, I don't think it's a person doing this anymore. They've asked me so many times now, who would want to do this to me? I told them nobody would, not a soul. The truth is, there is someone. Sam. She was always clinging to me. Even when we were kids. I was her world. That's why we were best friends. She didn't want anyone else. After our parents died, it got worse. A few years after their deaths, I thought about moving out, getting a little distance so we could live our own lives. But she threatened to kill me and then herself if I ever did. So, I didn't. I stayed with her because I didn't have a choice. Losing her was hard. Because I loved her. I know how it sounds, but I did. I loved her so much. But it was also freeing to not be around her all the time. To not have to manage or take care of her or be her everything. It's an ugly thing to say, but after her funeral, all I could think of was myself. Finally. I could have my own life. Finally, I could move on. But I can't. Because she won't let me. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, she'll follow me. I was her world in life, and now I'm her world in death. And I don't think she'll be happy until I'm in the ground with her. I'm scared to live. I'm scared to die. No matter what I do, she'll always be there. Up until last month, I'd spent the last three years working as a property inspector for a national real estate company. They had over 500 houses across the three-state region I covered. Between me and my boss, Willie, we were supposed to check at least once out every two months. That meant making sure that there were no leaks or notable wear and tear, no problems with water or electrics where they were turned on, and of course, making sure no one was getting inside and either squatting or vandalizing the owner's property. 
It wasn't a bad job. And while the work had been described to me as a part guard, part plumber, and electrician, honestly it required very little beyond showing up, taking notes, and pictures if I saw something that looked weird, and then reporting it to Willie. Simple stuff we might wind up doing ourselves, but the company had specialists for anything more complex or dangerous. And as for trespassers, I'd never found a single one my entire time working there. But then, eight months ago, I went into a house that was new on our rotation. This wasn't unusual, of course. While some properties seemed stuck in some permanent limbo of not being rented or sold, there was a fair amount of turnover with most of them, and every two-month rotation inevitably brought some different houses with it. From the outside, this one wasn't particularly noteworthy. It was a single-story ranch house with faded white vinyl siding that went back further than you'd have thought from the street. To quote a common Willieism, it had a real ass on it. The yard was in decent shape, though I could already see recommending whoever was cutting it coming by more often before the house started to be actively shown. And while I could use a good pressure washing, a circle of the exterior didn't lead me to check off any problem spots or needs for repair. And then I went inside. Opening the door and crossing the threshold into an empty house can feel a variety of ways. Most aren't really noteworthy at all, beyond a bit of stale air. Some places are stifling hot or unexpectedly cold, musty or just thick with the dust and the stench of roach or mouse droppings dying in the shadows. But this place... When I stepped through the front door, I immediately noticed the air felt thicker inside, almost as though I jumped off the edge of a pool into water and was now trying to walk along the bottom. I felt a moment of panic at the sensation, reaching for the light switch before remembering that the electrics were still off here. The house had been bought at a foreclosure sale, and it might be weeks or months before the company got around to turning utilities back on and putting the house with one of its agents. Muttering a curse, I dug out my flashlight and turned it on. It was early afternoon outside, but you couldn't tell it in here. Everything was murky and gray, the beam from the light seeming dim and feeble as it pushed out of the shadows crouched in every corner. Grumbling, I pushed my nerves down. I'd gotten over the unease of going into empty houses in the first couple of weeks of doing this job, and I wasn't going to freak myself out now. I wouldn't find anything different in this house than I had in a thousand others, and if I did, all I had to do was leave and call Willie. It wasn't a big deal. Walking down the front hall, I turned to the right. Brownish-looking carpet and bare yellow walls. No sign of any damage or anything having been left behind. This place had 12 rooms, according to the sheets, and I tended to work front to back, so before going through the door in the back wall of that room, I crossed over the main hall into the left-hand room. This was a smaller room, also brown carpet, green walls, nothing of note. Moving through the door on the far side, there should be one more room. A larger living room area that... I paused in the doorway, as my flashlight landed on something. It was an old rocking horse, with a wooden body and rockers of peeling black paint and molded plastic head that was faded with age but still identifiable as the snarling black face of a stallion. The leather saddle on the back of the horse is what stood out the most. Unlike the rest, it seemed to be in very good shape, with the luster of the dark brown skin seeming to almost glow under my light. The embossed golden lettering above the left stirrup was legible even at a distance. Nick's best steed. I felt my stomach tighten slightly. Something wasn't right here. It wasn't uncommon to find some trash or other things that the house cleaners had missed on a first inspection, but how would they miss something like this? Stepping back through the other room and into the hall, I reached for my notepad and hesitated. Normally, I would write things down as I found them, but I didn't want to here. I didn't like the idea of focusing my attention on anything other than my surroundings, of making... I hesitated, and then forced myself to finish my thought. 
of making myself vulnerable. Clenching my jaw, I stepped further down the hallway. I knew I was being stupid, but it didn't matter. Nerves had me now. I needed to finish doing a quick sweep of the house and just get out. The fourth room was empty. The fifth and sixth were the same. Then in the seventh room, there was a television sitting in the middle of the floor. It was a pretty old one, with a small curved screen of thick glass surrounded by a heavy wooden cabinet. How the hell had they left this sitting here? I felt a dull sense of fascination looking at it. It was really old and kind of interesting. Probably an antique that might be worth something to somebody, even if it didn't work. Crouching down, I gave the large metal channel dial a twist, each number between one and nine, making a satisfying click as it ratcheted by. Shining my light back across the front, I stopped when I reached the screen. The glass... The glass had lines, ridges in it. Six lines trailing down as though someone had run their fingers through clay, though these marks looked as though they'd been made by something melting their way into the glass as they went. I shivered and stood back up, my momentarily forgotten fear back stronger now. There was nothing. Plenty of houses had weird stuff left behind, right? Still, I was ready to be done and get out. Glancing around the room again, I moved on. Room 8, clear. Room 9, the last one of the right side of the house so far as I could tell, had some peeling wallpaper, but no signs of water damage or mold behind it. I crossed back over the main hall into room 10, and at first, I saw nothing out of the ordinary. Then I turned to look in the corner and saw the naked man crouched there, grinning at me. In that first moment of shock and panic, I took him in fully. His head was crudely shaved, with thin patches of hair still wisping away from a scalp covered in cuts and scabs. His face was thin and lean except around his eyes, which were red and puffy. Even now, as he stretched cracked lips wide to show me twin rows of gray teeth, he was crying his body shuddering with a faint sound somewhere between a laughter and a sob. Oh, fuck. Fuck, no. The next moment I was running for the front door, and I didn't stop until I was back outside and in my locked car. I called 911 then, waiting in my car for the cop to come and get out the trespasser. It took half an hour before someone showed up, and when they did, they looked skeptical. I made the mistake of telling 911 that not only was there some guy in the house, but he was naked and crying. At the time, I thought it'd make them come quicker, but instead it made them think it was some kind of practical joke. The officer was polite, though, asking me a few questions before telling me to wait outside. I could tell by his expression he didn't think he'd find anything, and as soon as he stepped back out, I could see that his suspicions had been confirmed. Still, when he came back to the car, I forced myself to ask if he saw the guy. He offered a slight frown. No, no sign of anyone in there right now. He gestured toward me in the car. You've been here the entire time, you said? Since you left the house? When I nodded, he frowned. Well, this is the only door in and out that I saw, so unless he climbed out of a window, I don't know where he would have went. He let the unspoken implication hang in the air for a moment before giving me a shrug. Still, let us know if you have any further problems and they'll send someone back out. I wanted to argue, to try and convince him, but I realized there was no point. What can I say and, and what did it matter? I was done for now. And when I went to talk to Willie, he'd know if there was anything else we should do. He'd been working that job for over 30 years, and there was very little he hadn't seen, after all. Where'd you hear about it, kid? The internet? I stared at Willie in confusion. 
We were at Brecken's, a diner we met at once a week to eat breakfast and compare notes, and I just finished telling him about the house and what I'd found there. I'd known his expression had changed as I talked, but at the time I just talked it up to him being concerned about what I'd seen. Now that I was done, though, he seemed not only tense, but almost angry. What are you talking about? He took a sip of coffee as he studied me over the cup. Look, I'm not calling you a liar. But if this is some prank you're trying to pull, just tell me now. I won't be mad. Where'd you hear about the hollow house? I stared at him blankly. Willie, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I swear. What's the hollow house? Sitting down the coffee, he sighed. I believe you. You're a good kid, and I've never known you to be a bullshitter. And hell, I don't know if anyone talks about it on the internet in the first place. I just figured that it might be on there somewhere like every other damn thing. He gave a small shrug. I learned about it at first, same time as you. Twenty, maybe twenty-five years ago. I went to a house that, on the outside, looked just like the rest. And then I saw the TV. Back then it wasn't so old looking as it would seem now, with everybody having giant things they hang on their wall, but it was still old and odd that had been overlooked. I felt my eyes widen. You mean you saw the... He cut me his look that said, hold off asking questions until he was done explaining something to me. I fell silent. Rubbing his eyebrow, he went on. Then I saw the rocking horse, just like you described, down to the Nick's best steed and everything. By this point, I was starting to get skittish, but I was quick to get spooked back then, and I told myself that's all it was. His hand trembled slightly as it trailed down to clasp the other one on the table. But then, I saw the man. We didn't have cell phones back then, and they encouraged us to threaten people and bully them out when we could. Not hurt them, but make them seem like we might. He shook his head and looked down at his coffee. The guy just kept staring at me, laughing and crying at the same time, just eyes locked on mine while I got his face and yelled. Told him I'd have to rough him if I had to. Willie gave a bitter chuckle. <laughs> all the while trying not to piss myself. He brought his gaze up to mine. That's when the guy's eyes shifted away from me. He was looking at something behind me now. In spite of myself, I couldn't help but break in and ask, What was it? What was behind you? Willie's face visibly paled. No, I, I don't want to talk about that. Looking away, he licked his lips. Anyway, I got out. Went and told a buddy of mine that worked for the company what I had seen. He'd heard of it before, too, and he knew what people called it. The Hollow House. I frowned. Okay, uh, if this is all true and you knew this place was messed up or haunted or whatever, why didn't you warn me before I went there? He gave me a little smile and shook his head. You don't understand. It's not the same house. It's never the same house, at least on the outside. Never in the same spot, same past owners, nothing. Believe me, I've looked into it some, and over the years I've talked to half a dozen people that have run across it too. Every one of them described seeing the same stuff on the inside, but they were in different houses all around the country all over the past 30 or 40 years when it happened. Sitting back, I let out a slow breath. How is that even possible? What is it? Willie spread his hands out and gave a deeper shrug. I have no idea. Not keen on finding out either. Leaning in, he lowered his voice slightly. That's why, the couple of times I've run across it since, as soon as I know where I'm at, I back out. In 
and from then on, that place gets my stamp of approval without me getting any closer than riding by to make sure it hasn't burned down. He held my gaze only for a moment. And that is exactly what you need to do. I nodded, but I could already feel my stomach tightening. I... I don't know, man. I can't lose this job. E even if it's all real, maybe it's just creepy, right? Like you've never gotten hurt from it and... I trailed off as Willie unbuttoned his sleeve and rolled it up. The first time I found the hollow house, I left with this. Just above his left elbow was a scar. The flesh there, dark and hard like a shadow, had been tattooed across his skin in the shape of a grasping hand. He reached over now and gripped my arm. It's not just a spooky story, kid. And you just got lucky this time. The five or six people that have told me about going into the hollow house, I've heard another dozen stories over the years about people that disappeared doing this job. How many of those do you think went into one of these places and didn't get out quick enough? was nodding now, terrified. Maybe it was how scared I looked that caused him to make the offer. Look, I'll adjust our schedules, okay? Put that house on my rotation. I snapped back a little out of my shock. Willie, you don't have to. He was already raising his hand to stop me. No, no. It's fine. I'm used to it, and I know the signs well enough to get out fast. Besides, I don't plan on stepping foot in that place. As long as I've been here, no one's going to hassle me if they find a problem I didn't report. He pointed at me. Not that you can let your guard down. If you stick with this job, you'll run across it again at some point. Sighing, I nodded. Yeah, sure. But are you sure? When he looked at me this time, he only met my eyes for a second before looking away. Yeah, kid. I'll be fine. For the next few months, everything went back to normal. I knew from the schedule that Willie would have visited the Hollow House twice, but he never mentioned it, and neither did I. I was grateful to not have to go there myself or risk faking my inspections, but I felt guilty for passing the risks on to him. Still, every time I went to a new house, there was now a moment of fear and tension while I tested the air and looked for signs of something being off. Nothing ever was, but that nervous anticipation never left me entirely, and that was enough to take the edge off the guilt at what Willie was doing for me, especially since I felt sure he wasn't actually going inside. The next month, a new corporate policy came down from the national office. To ensure that every property was being reviewed thoroughly, we were to take at least three photos of the interior of every house we inspected, including at least one that had a laminated property form in the shot. These forms were in every house, listing the address, property ID number, and various other details like square footage and local agent contact information. Every form was unique and were usually taped to the counter in the kitchen meaning that you couldn't just use another form from another house. My stomach dropped as soon as I got the email. And when I checked the schedule, I saw that Willie was supposed to be checking the hollow house again two weeks later. Enough time for me to talk to him when we did our weekly meetup. For us to come up with an answer. Or if not, for me to at least offer to take the house back. No, kid. It's okay. I'll figure something out. I frowned. Look, I didn't want to go in there either. Maybe I can fake the pictures, right? Make a new copy of the form and take pictures of it taped to a different counter in a different house. Not like they'd ever know. He looked thoughtful for a second as he considered it and then shook his head. It won't work. They don't store the info on those forms in any computers we have access to, so we'd have no way of knowing some of that stuff, like the local realtor that's listed without seeing the form. Besides, I know the way those suits think. 
They started those forms five years ago. Made a big deal about putting them all in the same place in the house and making sure every place had one. I wondered why at the time when they could just give the info to us and the real estate agents. Glowering, he stamped at a piece of egg. What do you think they were already planning this shit? Took pictures of the forms on the counters, so if they ever decided to do what they're doing now, they'd have something to catch fakes. Isn't that kind of paranoid? Willie shrugged. Only if I'm wrong. And I don't put much past a man looking to squeeze a dollar. Hell, I don't think it's a bad idea if I'm honest. He sighed. It's just damned inconvenient. Well, I mean, I can go and do it then. It can't be bad in there all the time, right? How else would they ever put the forms in, sell these houses? His eyes flicked up to mine. I don't know that they ever do sell them. I've kept an eye on the ones i found over the years, and best I can tell, none of them ever actually get sold. They just drop off the list after a while. No idea why, and I'm not going to look if I don't have to. He nodded as he chewed. Still, you're right. Can't be like that all the time. Maybe I'll hit it lucky. I'll take a bunch of shots of their damned form when I'm there. Enough to dole out until I retire. Stomach and nuts, I pushed out the question I didn't want to ask. Are you sure? Willie hesitated, and in that brief pause, he looked frail and old. When he spoke, his voice was steady, but barely above a whisper. Yeah, kid. I'm sure. I wanted to call Willie after his next check at the Hollow House, but I held off. I was going to be meeting him for breakfast the next day, and there was no reason to bug him or make it a bigger deal than it was already. Maybe the house had gone back to normal, and either way, he'd have to let me know if something had come up. Unless he never got back out. I tried to push the thought away, but I couldn't. Finally, I gave in, calling him that night. The phone rang several times, and each second I could feel it getting harder to breathe. What if something really bad had... Hello? Oh, Willie, thank God, man. I... I'm sorry. I, I just knew you had that house today, and I wanted to make sure you were okay. Uh, oh, yeah. It went fine. I sat down as relief flooded through me. Good, good. So you got the pictures you needed, right? It all went fine. I'm just real tired. Going to beg off meeting you tomorrow, if that's all right. I frowned. Other than one time when he was down with the flu for two weeks, Willie had never missed one of our breakfasts. You sure, man? You need me to bring you anything? No, I'll be fine. Thanks. I need to go now. I went to say more, but I heard the click as he hung up. I worried about him over the weekend, but it wasn't until I got a phone call next Tuesday that I knew something was really wrong. It was from the regional office. I asked if I'd heard from Willie in the last few days. He hadn't submitted a report since the middle of the week before, and they couldn't get him on the phone heart in my throat, I told them no, but as soon as I got back into town that afternoon, I'd go back out and check on it. Willie lived alone in a two-story house on the east side of town. The neighborhood had gone down in recent years, but Willie always kept his place in great shape. He told me once that he'd been terrible about keeping this place up when his wife was alive. Too much like his job, he said. Now that she was gone and with no kids or grandkids, he had lots of empty time to fill. So we decided on doing a better job of taking care of the house that she loved so much. I knocked on the door twice before ringing the bell, and I was starting to wonder if he was home, despite his car being in the driveway. Hitting the doorbell a second time, I called out. Willie? You in there? 
You sick or something? Still, no answer. Walking back off the porch, I debated what to do. Walking back off the porch, I debated what to do. I didn't want to bother him, but I didn't want him laying in there, sick or dying either. Maybe I should call the... My eyes landed on a rock at the edge of the flower bed. Or something that looked like a rock, at least. Crouching down, I picked it up and gave a brief, humorless laugh. It was a hide key Sliding back to bottom, I saw the house key was nestled inside the molded plastic base. Willie might get pissed, but so be it. I wanted to make sure he was okay. Fishing the key out, I went back up to the door and put it in. The key turned easily, and calling out to Willie that I was coming in, I started to open the door. I'd only opened it a foot when I met resistance from the other side. Looking up, I saw Willie's haggard face peering at me from the gap. His eyes were red and wild as he stared out, and his skin had a sickly, sweat-sheen glow to it. He was really sick. Hey, sorry to bother you, man. You look terrible, are you... Get away. His voice was a hoarse croak, and it didn't take long for me to see why. Black marks, the shapes of long fingers banded his neck like a collar. I held anger and fear welling up in my chest. Willie, what the fuck, man? Did someone hurt you? He squeezed his eyes shut, tears forming at their corners. No, just... Get away from here, kid. Don't come back. With that, he stepped back and shoved the door shut. I might could have stopped him, but I'd been transfixed by what I saw behind him in that brief glimpse into his house. By the time I realized what was happening, he'd already locked the door and slid home the deadbolt. My yelling and knocking didn't get any further response. I went back home and then called the cops. I asked him to do a welfare check. When I called back a couple of hours later, they said they'd gone by and spoken to Willie and he was fine other than being bundled up said he was fighting off a bug and stayed cold all the time, but that he didn't need them or his nosy co-worker bugging him all hours of the day and night. The cop then mentioned to me that 911 was for actual emergencies and that I should probably just leave the guy alone. And that's what I did. Willie never came back to work, and after a few more weeks I quit myself. I would reached the point where... I couldn't go into any new house, and it was only a matter of time before they fired me anyway. I didn't give up on Willie because of what the cops said, or even because Willie told me to go away. I tell myself that those would be reasons enough, but I know better. Willie was a good guy and my friend, and I should go back and check on him again whether he wants me to or not. But when my guilt is at my worst, when I'm close to driving over to the east side of town or giving Willie a call, something always stops me. The memory of that half-second glimpse into his house and the picture-perfect image of what I saw there gently swaying behind him. A faded, black rocking horse with a brown leather saddle polished to a high sheen. Between the seat and the stirrups, fine gold lettering so bright I could read it across the too thick gloom. Nick's best steed.